All right, so this talk is going to be about Scala and machine learning, and I'm sure a lot of you are already doing machine learning in some shape or form with MLib or H2O or some other technology. Um, but I would just like to say why Scala, first of all, considering that there are so many other technologies out there like Python or R and so on, and uh, also to show how easy it is to build um, um, an application from scratch, even if a library is non-existent. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, I'm just going to briefly, first of all, uh, refer to the existing um, uh, machine learning and data science ecosystem uh, in R and Python, just for reference, just to see what we might be missing in Scala or might not be missing necessarily. So I'll try to look at pros and cons review the JVM alternatives, not just Scala, but predominantly Scala because of the syntactic sugar and, and beauty that Scala provides us. And, um, and then I'll actually show a, a small demo. What if, for example, you didn't have, let's say, linear regression? Of course, you do have linear regression in, 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 in Spark and MLib, but just to show you how easy it is to build something. And in fact, if you look at, um, the key problem with uh, running linear regression at scale, it's really the optimizer, right? If, if you wanted to do the same thing with neural networks, as long as you can build an optimizer well, then, then the rest scales, right? And, uh, and how to do vectorization. Vectorization is a perennial problem no matter what algorithm. So again, a lot of these learnings actually do move, for, uh, move on to other algorithms. Well, Obviously, I don't have to convince you of the fact that machine learning is ubiquitous, from fraud detection and spam filtering, which have been around for decades, to recommender systems, to OCR, and even self-driving cars. So it becomes more common, even for non-machine learning people, to start dabbling in this area. And uh, because we have so many different use cases uh, for machine learning, natural language processing, machine vision, et cetera, there are actually tons of models. You know. People are fixated on, let's say, deep learning these days, but in fact, there are tons and tons of algorithms that are very specialized. Um, even for something like regression, right? You can have linear regression, LOES, MARS, KNN, decision tree regression, random forest regression, SVMs, neural networks, et cetera, right? Same with classification. You know, you could have naive Bayes decision trees, random forest, SVMs. Um, et cetera. You can even have neural networks for, cl for clustering, such as self-organizing maps. So obviously there are plenty of algorithms, and some of them are actually really fine-tuned to very specific problems, which is why it's nice to have a diversity of algorithms, not just, just fixate on one particular approach. And uh, you know, when you have so many algorithms, obviously you don't want to code every single one from scratch. It's, it's quite a nightmare to, to deal with this. And if you look at, say, at the R um, ecosystem, you see plenty of libraries. In fact, the, uh, the growth in the R libraries has, has been exponential over, over the last couple of years. And uh, we may not have 5,000 libraries uh, for machine learning statistics and NLP in, uh, in Scala, but we, I, I'm going to argue that we probably have enough to get started and to actually grow this, uh, this portfolio. Um, of course, uh, Python is nowhere near uh, R when it comes to the algorithmic coverage, but scikit-learn is definitely a very good start at machine learning, and so is um, and LTK for, for language processing. And uh, arguably, in some areas, Python is actually excelling. Like, Theano is a really great uh, uh, library for deep learning, as is PyBrain. And uh, the same you can say probably about Torch, although that's Lua, so that's another exotic uh, solution. But you definitely have a good uh, linear algebra and NumPy and data frame processing and Pandas, et cetera. So definitely a rich ecosystem. Same with plotting in Matplotlib. Um, how, uh, just to show how easy it is to write something in Python and just to basically make the point that this is the kind of stuff we really should be aiming for in Scala, not just you know, fixate on type inference and you know, implicit conversions and, and you know, monads and whatnot. You know, as a data scientist, I actually want to be able to write something like this in 30 lines of code, build an OCR system, at least for handwritten uh, digit recognition. Actually, out of this entire code base, only two lines or three lines of code are used for training the, um, uh, the uh, support vector machine and to predict. The, the rest is basically for printing out the confusion matrices and doing visualization. So in fact, training and, and prediction is basically three lines of code. 
And this is the kind of stuff we would really expect from, uh, from a modern machine learning library. But of course, you know, despite all the benefits that R provides, and, and same with Python, you have lots of problems, right? First of all, dynamic typing. We were at a Scala conference, so I assume that's kind of a given that we would prefer static typing. Um, not just because of the potential type mismatches. I mean, I'm sure if, uh, to those of you who've, who've been using R, or especially Python for, for, uh, for machine learning, it must have happened that you were writing a print statement and you concatenated a, an integer with a string and, and Python blew up saying, oh, explicit is better than implicit, so you should have done an SDR on that integer, right? Uh, I don't want to know that things at runtime. I want to know them at compile time. I don't want to waste my time running a simulation for a few hours and then having it blow up, right? But there are you know, even more fundamental problems like like typos, right? I can just mislabel the, the, the method name and the code blows up at some point and I don't know about this till it, till it wastes a week running a deep learning algorithm or something, right? So clearly, clearly uh, it would be nice to have static typing, but at the same time, I wouldn't probably give up static typing if I had no, uh, no data science ecosystem at all because people expect me to deliver results, right? But, you know, just going back to the problems with, uh, with R and Python, um, these languages definitely don't have good runtimes. I would argue that the JVM is also not a great runtime, uh, and I'll tell you why, spe specifically for, uh, for uh, machine learning and, and numeric processing. I mean, one obvious case is boxing. Um, another case is uh, cache locality and, and vectorization, so the JVM has its own problems, but if I were to compare this to, say, R or Python, they definitely have more problems. R does everything by copy, so so basically you have a, a, a memory problem very quickly. Python has the global interpreter lock, which is kind of sad in the era when we have multi-core cell phones, let alone servers, um, that you have to do everything through multi-processing, like it's, I don't know, developing web apps circa 1995. Um, you know, uh, when people were doing CGI, you know, it's kind of the same, the same problem, essentially, and it's kind of too late to, to be dealing with multiprocessing when, when, when multi-core is the way even a Raspberry Pi works with four cores these days, right? And execution is actually slow, too. So even if you use something like PyPy, which is a just-in-time compiler for Python, or the R bytecode compiler, they're still relatively slow compared to the JVM. So even for a single threaded process, uh, processing, they're slow. Um, as many machine learning people say, you know, R is fast when it's written in C++, and same with Python. You know, a lot of these libraries have been written in C++, but that means you have to juggle two languages, so that's kind of a pain. And uh, of course, when you think about, uh, um, about um, math specifically, math is declarative, it's not imperative, right? I, what does it mean in math that I take a logarithm of I plus and do some I plus plus in the in the middle of the of this code, right? I'm not side affecting anything. I'm just pushing in some value and expecting a result out of the function, right? A function can have a, a, a limited domain, right? It can be a partial function, which Scala actually supports. But I'm not side affecting. Um, um, math is always referentially transparent. It's always idempotent, and some things are explicitly. Uh, um, explicitly uh, declarative. And it's not just piano numbers and factorials and Fibonacci numbers, but it's, for example, defining how uh, the activation of, of a neural network works, right? The, the, the input to the, to the layer is actually the output of a previous layer, so you can recurse through the whole structure declaratively. So math is just very amenable to this kind of thinking. And um, you know, people say R is a functional programming language, right? Because you can have a function within a function, and a function can be a first-class citizen, so it's kind of functional, right? But it doesn't even have Taylor recursion. It blows up here in this particular example, right? And, uh, and in Scala, no problem, right? Because it was designed to be really functional. So, okay, we know that there are problems with R and Python, and we know that Scala could be potentially the solution, but how does the ecosystem look, right? If, if I need to write a singular value decomposition before I do any math, right, and spend time writing, writing the Scala code for it, that's not good, right? So, I, so we, have to, we have to have some sense of what's out there so that we don't have to start from scratch. So first of all, 
numeric abstractions. There's the Axel library by Adam Bingle. I'm not sure if Adam is here, but I saw him earlier. Um, he really did a great job with this library. There's Spire by Eric Osheim and Tom Switzer, really phenomenal numeric abstractions, including floating point filters that are almost as accurate as a big decimal, but are, fast, but are as fast as a float. Um, these guys are really brilliant, and also really beautiful DSLs and macros and whatnot. These guys you know, are wh definitely scale whizzes. When it comes to linear algebra, which is sort of the bread and butter of, of machine learning, um, there are plenty of Java libraries like EGML, LA4J, MD4J is a Java-based library, although now it has a Scala wrapper, there's MD4S. Uh, that's Adam Gibson's uh, library, which was designed as part of the Deep Learning 4J project. And my, my personal favorite is Breeze, which is um, uh, part of the Scala, Scala NLP project uh, uh, led by David Hall. This particular library is not just a beautiful Scala DSL, which supports the vast majority of linear algebra that you would ever want, essentially at the MATLAB level, but it also uh, actually calls Fortran um, native BLAS code to do the, the uh, numeric processing. And this is actually a really important point. As, as I mentioned, the JVM is kind of sucks at numerics, and uh, to make a point, it barely supports any kind of vectorization. Um, Java 7 started supporting uh, basic vectorization for loops, but it doesn't support MMX probably, it doesn't support SSE, it doesn't support AVX, doesn't, and, and vectorization has been around for, for Intel CPU since like 1995. So, um, uh, if you can process eight floating point numbers on a single core instead of one uh, at any given time, that's a big boost, right? So clearly it's important to, to be able to run uh, vectorized code. And unfortunately, for in the Java world, uh, linear algebra is fast if it's written in Fortran. But these guys actually did the uh, JNI bindings to BLAS, so we don't have to worry about this while writing beautiful Scala code. Um, you know, the, the Python community is definitely... Um, uh, passionate about uh, 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 reproducible research and, and notebook style computing. So Andy Petrella, who is, um, I saw him here, um, he, he created the Spark notebook, which is an extension of the original Scala notebook, which was a, po a port of the IPython notebook to Scala. Jupyter Scala also has a Scala kernel. Uh, that's based on the Jupyter Python project. There's Apache Zeppelin. There's, of course, the commercial Databricks solution as well, um, which supports Scala, but also Python and SQL. Um, so, so we can do reproducible research in notebooks as well. Um, for plotting, you know, we don't quite have GNU plot or MATLAB plotting or, say, um, uh, matplotlib, but I would say Wisp is a good first start. There's the Lightning Visualization Server, which is actually language agnostic. It just has REST APIs, but there's a Scala wrapper for it. Um, Breeze has some basic visualization. I guess this is the weakest point, but you can actually work with what you have already. Um, and for machine learning itself, um, Breeze offers a bunch of algorithms. Um, there is MLib for Spark if you want to run in the distributed setting. Um, um, H2O has, has its own Spark port called Sparkling Water, which runs off heap and is very efficient. And they have some of their own algorithms. There's Deep Learning for J, uh, which does some of the deep learning models as well. So, so we have some existing ecosystem, not quite the Python one, or but 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 a good start, right? Good enough to actually get productive. Um, but my favorite uh, uh, part of the JVM ecosystem is actually the NLP ecosystem because this one actually beats uh, uh, NLTK, um, the, the 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 parsing algorithms and part of speech tagging algorithms and so on are actually much better than, than NLTK. So, so even scientifically, it, it outperforms uh, the Python ecosystem, and definitely in terms of the speed and, 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 um, and, and feature set. So here we have Stanford, Core NLP, and LinkPipe, and Mallet. These are Java-based libraries. But uh, Epic, Pac, and Factory, the, the three ones at the top, are actually fully Scala-based. And in fact, uh, Pac, the, uh, the, the middle icon at the top, is a GPU-based parser. So you can even get the GPU speed uh, for, for parsing. So, uh, so the, the NLP ecosystem is definitely really good on the JVM, even if you have problems with, with some other areas a little bit. But what if there's no library for something, right? How difficult is it to build it? 
Well, I would argue that it's not because Scala is a good language, so you can get productive pretty quickly even if you have to build something from scratch. So um, why? Well, first of all, functions are first class citizens, so if you're writing an optimizer, you can just support, uh, provide the gradients and, um, and the cost function as an argument, right? No need to write like new wrapper impl like in Java or something like that, right? You have functors and monads, so you can do whole pipelines of transformations, which is really convenient. And of course, the, the, the functional programming practices um, encourage referential transparency, mutability, lack of side effects, declarative programming, and other things that are actually really useful for math and are really useful for writing bug-free code. So that definitely helps. But uh, syntactically, Scala supports a lot of things that are extremely convenient, such as implicit conversions, and as I'm gonna show in a demo in a second, you can, um, for example, build one model to run on both Scala collections and RDDs uh, through implicits. And this is actually really convenient. Databricks was talking at, uh, at uh, the Spark Summit how they now want to have a version of MLlib that runs on a single machine, not just on Spark, because when you're running on a single machine, you actually get a lot of overhead from Spark, such as having the scheduler execute and message passing and a lot of things that actually are not necessary uh, in process. And so they actually want to have a version of MLlib uh, that, that, uh, that runs in process on Scala collections. But if you have implicit conversions, you can just write your code in terms of an abstraction, in terms of some trait, right, which will redirect either to Scala collections or RDDs without having to re rewrite any code. And if you write another implementation of this trait, you can run on Flink or something, right? So, so implicits are actually quite powerful. And of course, thanks to type inference, named function arguments, you don't have to write the builder pattern like in Java here, um, you don't have to remember the order of the arguments of the constructor and stuff like that, and write final boilerplate, boilerplate, right? So uh, a big time saver. So uh, let's actually build something. Um, I'm going to argue that in 15 minutes we can build two optimi optimization algorithms, stochastic gradient descent and autograd using Breeze's linear algebra. So this code will actually run vectorized in Fortran at, at blazing speed. Um, uh, and then we're gonna write linear regression cost and gradient uh, functions. Uh, the implicit, and I'm gonna show the implicit conversions uh, to abstract the computation of our Scala collections and Spark. So you just provide whatever um, 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 data type you want and it's gonna run on, on either. And then plot the, uh, plot the optimization results to show how, how the algorithm converged and uh, run against the synthetic data sets to validate uh, the results. So first of all, just a quick review of linear regression. For those who may not remember, you have um, an explanatory variable or, or a so-called feature, and you have a dependent variable or a so-called target. You can have multiple features predicting a target, but here we just have one feature X, which predicts Y, and, and we have some error term associated with, the, with the, this uh, XY pair, and we're trying to fit uh, the, the, the best line that minimizes the sum of squared errors. So um, you know we could write it as 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 a vectorized equation, and 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 the, these matrices below actually show show you how how to write it in term, in terms of vectors. So here's your actual vectorized representation, which is how we're tr we're going to exploit SIMD operations on a CPU through uh, through BLAS. And uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, updates your weights according to a learning rate. Uh, but uh, you, you provide a, a learning rate annealing so that the algorithm stabilizes over time. You can do a screw root or just n times i, where n is the number of observations per, per iteration and i is the number of the iteration. Adagrad actually scales by the gradients, so in the direction in which the gradients are very, un, uh, the, the learning is very unstable and the gradients are really large over time, the learning rate is attenuated more than in the direction in which the, the, the gradients are small and the convergence is stable. So this is kind of like DFIDF for learning, uh, for, for optimization, as, as the original um, authors of the Adagrad paper point, uh, put it. And the cost is just the sum of squared residuals, x beta minus y, and since we're doing linear algebra, we're not doing summation, we're just doing transpose times the, the x beta minus y, and the gradient is just the partial derivative, uh, like so. Okay, so let's just briefly look at this, um, at, uh, at, the, at the implementation. 
Um, by the way, this code is on GitHub, and um, I have a separate repo called Scout Data Science, but this talk was inspired by the work that my colleague uh, at Nitro, Malcolm, and myself are doing for a book that we're writing for Manning Press. It, it's going to be uh, meeped in a, in a couple of weeks, hopefully, um, so, so be on the lookout for, for the actual uh, meep release, um, and, but, the, but the GitHub repo already exists. And, um, and let me just show you some code. Uh, I guess this screen is kind of low res, but I'll do what I can. So um, let's see. OK. OK, so first of all, you have to have some representation of your data. It could be just a regular bean like, like this with a target uh, for, for this regression model, which is a double because it's a continuous value, and then features, which is a dense vector of double. And this dense vector is actually a breeze type, which, uh, which if you have your BLAS routines installed and you import breeze natives, um, it actually redirects to BLAS, so, so your computations are actually running natively, not on the JVM. Um, then you have to have some optimization history uh, with a sequence of cost values, sequence of weight values if you're doing early stopping and want to backtrack to the best uh, value uh, before, before the code starts to overfit, then you have your gradients, which, uh, which allow you to scale the, the learning rate for Autograd. Um, then we have a bunch of types for the grad function, cost function, weight update, weight initialization. So these are essentially just uh, function objects, and I could have written them without, uh, without these case classes. But the, way, the reason I wanted case classes as opposed to just lambdas is because if you have a lot of um, named arguments, you would like to know, you would like to be able to refer them by name, keyword args essentially. Um, as opposed to remembering, remembering their position. If you have three double arguments, how are, are you going to remember the position? So if you actually have a case class, it's, it's going to allow you to call by name. Um, let's see. And then we have this vectorized data type, which um, explicitly takes care of the fact that instead of taking one target value at a time, which is a double, you actually take a vector of doubles, and the features are not a vector of doubles, they're a matrix, because each row is, is one example, and, and, and n rows give you n examples at a time, so you're doing a vectorized operation. Um, let's see, after this, we have to make sure that we can uh, basically rep, uh, Okay, let me first show you that this data. So this data is actually due to Malcolm. He, he wrote this for, for the book, and this is what I was talking about, the possibility of having a trait with standard methods such as map, reduce, uh, take, etc. cetera, and, um, um, and instead of using, say, a Scala collection or an RDD, you use this, this trait. Um, but the implicit conversions generate instances that delegate to Scala collections or RDDs. So then um, if you provide a data, uh, an object that's an RDD, and, uh, it'll run on Spark, and if you provide an object that's a Scala collection, it's going to run locally without any of the Spark overhead. And here are your implicit conversions to traversable, which is, which is an underlying type in, in the Scala collections library, or an implicit conversion to, to the RDD. Um, and here's your uh, concrete implementation for, uh, for traversables and another implementation for RDDs. And this is really useful. You could provide another implementation for Flink and run on Flink instead of Spark. So, so this is really where Scala shines with the implicit conversions. And um, now we probably should look at the optimizer. So the optimizer you know, takes the standard things for, for stochastic algorithms, such as the initial learning rate, the momentum, the, and, and here it actually takes the uh, gradient function and cost function, so you provide first class functions, right, for, for a particular algorithm, whether it's logistic regression or linear regression or even a neural network or something. And, and the update function is actually the specific implementation of the update rule. So stochastic gradient descent is going to have a different um, update rule than, than Adagrad, but again, it's a first class function. So no boilerplate there. 
and mini batching because we're, we're doing the stochastic uh, convergence and we provide the data. And after that, it's essentially a fold. We, we, we basically apply this, this, um, this update function n number of times where n is the number of iterations. And, um, and that's it. So this is essentially just iteration without writing for loops or something. And now we just need the concrete implementation of the, of the optimizers. So um, stochastic gradient descent essentially um, takes the learning rate, divides it by this annealing step, which is the sample size and the iteration number. You can add momentum, which is basically a, a, a multiplier for the previous weight update. So you attenuate the um, uh, gradients in the directions in which they're unstable and, and increase them in the directions in which they're stable. So if you have a narrow valley, it actually propels it against this narrow um, narrow valley and ignores the, the, the seesaws uh, to the sides. That's what momentum does essentially. And, uh, and then you just update the weights and you add the momentum if, if you choose to do that and you provide this up history object. So that's all of SGD. And because we're using this, this data trait, not the Scala RD, uh, the RDD or the Scala collection uh, concrete type, this will run on both Spark and, and, uh, and Scala collections. And also, um, because Scala collections don't have the aggregate method, which has a sequential step and, 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 uh, um, and a parallel step, uh, you could basically, this trait can have the redirection of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the aggregate method in the case of a Scala collection to essentially a fold, whereas in, 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 in the case of the Spark RDD, it actually redirects to the, uh, to the aggregate method, which already exists in Spark. And for autograd, we actually have to scale by the diagonal of the Hessian, which we do here. And again, it's very little code because we are using Breeze, which, which uh, benefits from the fact that Scala has operator overloading. So we don't have to write dot add when we can do plus, right? Or, or if we're doing a Hadamard product, we can just say colon star instead of calling dot Hadamard like we would have to do in Java or something. So it basically looks very much like math, which is nice because then we can do a one to one comparison between the, the actual mathematical formula and the, and the code. So that's really the testament to why sometimes operator overloading is useful and why it kind of sucks that Java dropped it from C++ and Scala has it back. Because when you're doing math and you know what these symbols are, it, it may actually be useful. And um, let's see. And then I do some plotting, which is going, uh, which is probably the only imperative part of the code because plotting is side affecting after all. And this is actually using Wisp. Um, so it starts a, a web server that uh, draws some high charts plots. And uh, let's see. Oh, and we just need the linear regression, cost function, and gradient. So the cost function is really simple. It's just the sum of squared residuals. So we have the features time weights minus the target. And, and we just uh, map over these values, square them, and do a reduce left, right? It's really simple since it's just linear regression. And for gradients, it's equally simple, right? We just do features time weights minus target times features transpose just like on the slide. So again, I, I'm just really following the, the math and just, and just typing it up without actually having to think about how the API will look like. So it's really nice because it's very close to the original math. Um, but that's thanks to David Hull's Breeze library uh, for linear algebra. And now for this autograd demo, I'm actually creating a fake data set which basically has an intercept of three and a slope of 10. And I'm generating a thousand of, of these random um, um, variates that are uh, distributed as a standard normal. And, uh, and so the targets are the intercept plus the slope times, times the, the normal, uh, normal variate from, from the features. And uh, then I'm just trying to see if uh, when, when, I, when I do this convergence, if I actually get the coefficients 3 and 10 or close to that value. And as you can see, because of this uh, nice, um, uh, this data wrapper that Malcolm wrote, I can actually uh, um, uh, create either a this data 
um, for an RDD or for a local uh, Scala collections. And then I call optimize, linear regression cost and linear regression gradient are just functions, thanks to Scala's FP features, and that's it. And now let's just run it, and I actually have a WISP plot, so I'll be able to show you something at the end. Uh, it, run, it runs a bunch of iterations. It's probably way too many relative to what I need, so it may take a little bit of time. But here's the plot. And the expected coefficients were 3 and 10. And for example, stochastic gradient descent got 3.4 and 9.2, but Adagrad got 3 and 10. So Adagrad definitely converged better. And as you can see, it may have been unstable at the beginning, whereas uh, um, stochastic gradient descent, which is in light blue, was much more stable. The cost was much less. But if you look towards the end, it actually converged to a much lower value. So Adagrad was unstable, but it actually converged to better value at the end. So one, one nice thing that you know, Python and MATLAB and, and R people take for granted is the plotting. You, know, you may look at thousands of numbers, but you can quickly figure out what the heck is going on if you're, if you're able to visualize it. And even in Scala, you can use something like WISP um, or other plotting libraries to, uh, to uh, basically make some progress here. But um, I guess the point is here, you know, linear regression is something that already exists in MLA, but what if I wanted it at, you know, uh, a, a deep belief network or, you know, uh, some particular rendition of support vector machine that didn't exist in MLib or in, or in some non-distributed Scala library, or what if I wanted, you know, the latest to implement the latest paper. Like, let's say I'm in the word to vec era and, and the glove paper by, by Stanford is released and I want to implement it. Well, I, I guess I was trying to just make the point that if, um, if uh, something doesn't exist because Scala has nice functional programming features and because you already have uh, linear algebra uh, primitives and, and, and other DSLs to get you started, even, you even have plotting, you don't have to completely start from scratch and you can actually build something in an afternoon. Maybe not a super complex model, but, uh, but you don't have to essentially write, you know, a lot of C++ mallocs and stuff to plug to Python later. So I, I, would say, I would say Scala is definitely a nice environment, even if you're forced to build something from, from scratch because it may not already exist in the ecosystem the way it would say in R. And, uh, and it definitely will scale way, way better than in R, which will probably uh, you know, throw up and, and throw some garbage collection error because, because you loaded too much data. So. I guess I guess the, the the closing point here is, you know, the Python ecosystem did, uh, didn't exist for for machine learning when the R ecosystem was already built out, and the Python people realized, you know what, we don't want to use R, we want to use Python, and let's build something. And and the Scala ecosystem and the JVM ecosystem in general already exist to to some degree, to a reasonable degree, I would argue, especially for natural language processing. And if something doesn't exist, then as a community, we might as well just build it. So, because um, we already have a good start. So, I guess that's it. Any questions? Yep. Oh, the MEEP? Um, that depends on the publisher. Uh, we have half of the book written, but they want some small, like, stylistic corrections. And I think. In the next maybe six weeks or something, we will we will make them. But at at that point, it will really depend on whether the publisher decides to release it or not. But but that's essentially the timeline. Hopefully, Manning, yes. Yep. Uh, well, the current title is Machine Learning for Big Data, and the underlying technology that we're talking about is Spark, but, you know, until they actually release it, who knows what the final version will be? I guess that's the current, uh, current title, but that's a good question, so. Any other questions? Yep. From plotting? Aside from plotting, 
Yeah, aside from blotting, is there anything else missing? Well, I would say a bunch of things. First of all, symbolic processing. This is sort of a given in Python with uh, SymPy and in MATLAB and in Octave. But I would say R kind of misses it too, so it's not completely bad, but it's nice to be able to say I have this humongous equation and solve, take the derivative of it without me having to take a derivative, so that's kind of cool. The other thing is um, definitely deep learning. You know, deep learning for J is a good start, and I'm going to ignore the fact that it's Java because they are working in a Scala wrapper. Uh, the bigger problem is that they're focused more on image processing right now than natural language processing, and we at Nitro are focused on NLP, so that is an issue. Uh, but um, honestly, I would say I would say definitely the, the the biggest issue is plotting to me at least because a lot of other stuff exists. And also, there's kind of there there's one issue that sort of is is difficult with static typing, which is that a lot of what, for example, Theano does is basically meta programming and when you have a language that's dynamic and can write itself at runtime and execute itself you know like when you look at for example the ruby and rails community like probably half of their code is meta programming and i'm trying to debug it and they're like oh this code hasn't been written yet because it writes itself at runtime and um, sure it's really horrible to debug but at the same time it's easier to do something like automatic differentiation where you can apply say a symbolic toolbox and write the derivatives at runtime based on whatever the user decided to 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 concoct uh, as the model and this is definitely harder for static languages but i think it's definitely a worthy goal uh, maybe one solution is to basically say we have a subset of models that have certain architectures and we allow some flexibility but the types are generally known, and it's just the composition that becomes flexible. And at that point, you don't have to write arbitrary um, derivatives at runtime uh, or something. So this is definitely one of the things that that probably still have to be done. Um, but but I, I would say the start is definitely okay. You know, the the just having the linear algebra is actually powerful. When when I sit in MATLAB, most of what I do is just matrix operations and plotting, and uh, and I would say you know that's that's what already exists. And also I would say there are all, there are a lot of good Java bindings for that you can reuse in Scala, such as for example Java CV. If you want to use the C++-based OpenCV library for machine vision, so sure it's Java, but you can always write some nicer abstraction on top of it in Scala. But you already have the JVM binding, so you don't have to write JNI code or something. So it's, uh, I would say it's a good start, you know. So. Sorry, what's my best uh, recommendation for what? Yeah, I would say there's definitely deep learning for J, but um, as I mentioned, it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you want to do, say, convolutional neural networks because you're doing uh, machine vision, then that's good enough. If you want to do, uh, uh, let's say uh, long short-term memory networks or recurrent neural networks for uh, for natural language processing, then it's probably not there yet. Um, uh, but there are other libraries for Scala, such as Neuron, which are sort of more NLP focused. Um, it's neither of these solutions probably approaches Theano. But there are also um, sort of more traditional neural networks uh, libraries, such as NCOG, which are Java-based, and they're actually really, really solid. They have OpenCL bindings. They have um, a lot of architectures that people actually ignored in deep learning, such as self-organizing maps, which are extremely good nonlinear um, clustering algorithms. Um, so there's a variety. Basically, if, if, if you want to look at more traditional neural networks, NCOG is a great solution. If it's more NLP focused, then it's probably Neuron. If it's more vision focused, it's Deep Learning for J. Um, these things are definitely evolving still. Um, Oh, 
Well, I think FP is just a good design principle in general for math because math is declarative and math is side effect free and and a lot of the abstractions are based on the ability to pass functions around. So if you have an optimizer and you want to say, this is my weight update, you know, the weight update will be probably a function that takes some input and produces some output. So if you can provide the function as an argument, that's actually cool. I mean, that's even possible in Java 8, but, uh, but that's exactly the point, that Java 8 is now catching up with Scala because they realize that, that actually having lambdas as first class citizens instead of as some you know anonymous classes with with a method inside is actually a useful idea um, also the also java doesn't have tail recursion which is a problem if you're trying to replace looping with recursion in many cases it's not just just because i want to be religiously functional but because um, a recursive uh, representation of the math actually makes sense to the mathematician um, so, so, so I guess I guess functional programming is pretty useful. I mean, even even if you look at Spark, for example, uh, PySpark uh, uh, is following the same principles, and Python at least has lambdas. It doesn't have advanced functional programming, but at, le at least has lambdas, and that that seems to be useful. Uh, type inference helps with reducing boilerplate, since this is a statically typed language. So. I, I would say the general design is good uh, of, of, of Scala for these kinds of problems. I mean, the biggest problem, as I said, is the JVM itself, right? The JVM will lift your, you know, primitives into into um, instances of capital double or capital integer in a list when you wanted primitive ints, and it's going to destroy your cache locality and generate garbage collection and. And, the, and Java will not vectorize properly. The only two languages that do any kind of vectorization, I think, are, well, three languages, C, C++, and, and Fortran, essentially. Java started in Java 7, but it's not nearly where it should be. There, there's some talk about Java 10 actually having uh, heterogeneous computing, so like automatic GPU computing and stuff. So what Martin was saying that the effort is being done for Scala, there might be a general effort for the JVM as it interprets the bytecode. So maybe maybe that's a duplicated effort because the JVM will have it on its own. But Java has been kind of behind schedule with a lot of their promises that are already um, listed on the on, on, on the community proposals. Uh, so maybe it's better if Scala actually leads the way. Um, but these are the big problems. You know, the JVM is still a hundred times faster than Python for, for machine learning, but it's definitely slower than C++ because of the memory locality, cache locality, you know, garbage collection, boxing, and all kinds of other junk that really shouldn't be there. Um, Java 9 is going to have value classes, so at least you won't have boxing anymore. If you want to have a tuple, the tuple will not be boxed anymore, and I think that's a huge win, but there are other things such as vectorization, which may not be there in Java 9 yet, so. Which is why we actually call Fortran at the end of the day, but at least from Scala, so you at least you don't write Fortran anymore. You just call a nice Scala DSL for it. So, anything else? All right, I guess that's it from me. Thank you.